The focus today is, is on the stem cell biology. Um, I'm going to give an overview of the FCDI part of the business. And then my colleague, Dr. Amber Jolly, is going to come through and give you a technical presentation on diseases of aging, which I think you guys will find very interesting. So again, thanks everybody for coming and, and thanks for taking the time to listen to us. If you aren't familiar with our company, uh, we were founded in 2004 uh, based on the work that came out of Dr. Jamie Thompson's lab around IPS technology. Um, it, that was a long time ago now when all this was founded. And what the company has now evolved to is a state of where our real core competence is in the production of stem cells on a routine, reliable, high quality basis. Um, so we moved from being the market leaders in making IPS cell lines back when all this started to now being the market leaders in taking that, that core material and turning it into differentiated cells of a variety of uh, cell backgrounds that you, know, you can literally plug and play. Now it's, that's now the business model of the company is to continue to deliver these high value cells so that you can use them as a reproducible resource. And that's what you're gonna hear about uh, today. Uh, I started by mentioning that we're now part of Fujifilm, so we've got other representatives of Fujifilm as well. Two colleagues over here from, from FISI, if anybody has questions, I'll have a couple of overview slides on some of their capabilities if you aren't familiar with them. Um, and in the case of Fujifilm uh, CDI, our core competency really is in the, in the biology of, of IPS cells. So we have teams internally that still use our core competency to make new IPS lines. But the bulk of, I, I think, what we're uh, focused on now is that production level, making them routinely and reproducibly every time. Uh, uh, myself and one of my colleagues are representing here from the Madison, Wisconsin office. That's where we're headquartered, and that's where, quote unquote, all the magic happens. So um, there are two markets for our cells. I, I am primarily here today to talk about the discovery research tools business, but there is a second division within the Madison location that is now involved in delivering these cells for direct therapeutic applications. So we have GMP production facilities where we are working with partners. You may have heard about a couple of them in the news, Blue Rock and Century, um, that are using our cells now directly for cell-based therapies. So all of this started with the capabilities that we built out in discovery research, and it's very nice to see that it's now migrating to the level where it's being successful for therapies as well. I think obviously that's the future, and that was what everybody saw as one of the big benefits of IPS technology many, many years ago. So maybe I'll just pause for a second, do a check, and make sure everybody's got audio at the other sites, everybody can see and hear. There isn't any echo or anything. Excellent. All right. All right. So why IPS? This is an, always an important question for me with any technology, the big question of why. Why IPS? Well, there's plenty of ways to do cell-based assays out there in the world today. Uh, and there's been ways to do this for a long, long time. I think IPS addresses a number of the challenges with methods that, that many of us have been using for decades. I'll age myself, but um, uh, many of you have have seen all these alternate approaches of pure animal studies, primary cell studies, uh, engineered uh, cell lines. Um, the promise of IPS is really to take real differentiated end stage human cells and have them be usable in the same way that a HeLa cell or a BHK cell or anything else would be used, but capture that human biology in a reproducible manner. I think that's the promise that has always been part of IPS and now it's really being delivered. For anybody in the room who has, you know, went and accessed an IPS line from somewhere and attempted to differentiate it on your own, you know it's a challenge. So the benefit that we deliver is that value of having the differentiation done for you, saving you all that time and money and giving you something that's plug and play. And obviously these are real human cells with high levels of characterization on expression level, marker analysis, karyotype, so there's a lot of valuable information and behind the cells uh, that make them such important research tools. And all the things down the bottom about availability, functionality, translatability, that's the sort of data that's taken us a couple decades almost to develop and get to the point that we're at right now so that these can be reproducible and reliable tools. 
So what do we provide? Um, I'll encourage you to visit our website if anything here today strikes you and see if there's um, a particular cell type that maybe we didn't discuss today that you might want to learn more about. Um, but we are the global leader in providing both the healthy, apparently healthy normal cells and disease cell models for a range of different cell backgrounds. We actually have a lot more than just on our website, but we made a strategic decision a few years ago to focus on the cardiac and neuro portfolio in general, given the strong market interest there. But we do have a number of other cell types in the hematopoietic area. We have hepatocytes, we have MSCs, there's a variety of other cells and we're always developing new ones. So um, if there are things that are of interest that you don't see on our website, feel free to contact any one of us and you probably will see Sean and Amber around here more than you'd see me, of course, I'm visiting today. Um, and the applications are almost endless for these cells. I, I listed three or four on the slide here that are the common applications for what people do with our cells, but the applications are endless and we, we learn every day from people like you on, on what, what, what everybody's doing with our cells. So the cells are branded iCells. Those are the products. Uh, you'll see also some things called MyCell on our website, which are just customized versions of iCells with certain disease mutations in them. Um, really, I think what sets us apart from the other players out there in the field that make cells from IPS is our quality and our reproducibility. For all the cells that you see here, we've made dozens, if not many, many dozens of batches of cells over the years. Um, we have statistics on our quality control and our metrics. Uh, they are at the point where they are a reproducible manufactured product. And I think that's the, the benefit. The breadth of line is important because everybody has different needs. And as you see down the bottom, we right now have three new cell types in development. I think that's a pretty realistic expectation of what you should see from us every year. Three to five new cell types that, that come out. We're branching out into some new areas. You, you'll see some news on a couple of them uh, after Labor Day. I can't mention them yet, but uh, keep an eye on our website or our LinkedIn page and, and you'll hear more very shortly. But the cell types we offer are all listed here. Visit our website, you can get the details on the technical data packages that we offer for this, the information on marker analysis, all the type of technical detail that you might wanna see, or you can come and talk to uh, Sean and Amber afterwards as well. So in the beginning, as I said, the real core competency was simply making the IPS lines. Many people were trying different ways to do it. You were getting your primary isolates from all kinds of different sources, human blood, human skin, uh, human hair follicles, all kinds of things that you could try to get a, a stem-like cell from and de deliver IPS. So we spent years building that foundation and that background of IPS lines that we knew we could differentiate in the other cells. The next step was proving the quality of those cells, doing functional assays on them, you know, electrophysiology, marker analysis, high content screening, phenotype analysis. So after we'd, we'd proved that we could take a variety of cells and say differentiate them into a cardiomyocyte and do that reproducibly, then there was years of work of showing what you can do with them and all the technical specs that you can develop around these cells. Um, now, the core competency is the manufacturing capability. So it's one thing to be able to do a differentiation once and make 100 vials of cells and put them in the liquid nitrogen. It's another thing to reproducibly make thousands and thousands of units of cells every year. That's really where I think you'll find value in working with us with that experience. But the data that backs it all up and all the functional and application data you find from our cells is also really important. Um, so the other promise of IPS was the whole notion that you could take now these high value cells and that you could develop disease in a dish, phenotype or genotype, from those cells. That's a, that's a part of our business that is still very active. We've done a number of these things. Um, if you look at our microglia uh, launch that happened uh, um, in 2019, I always say last year because I forget 2020 even happened. Um, it's a forgettable year. Uh, but if you look back at when we launched that, we had a different strategy. We launched it with an apparently healthy normal and a number of disease relevant mutations so that people could right at our first launch go and have a disease in the dish phenotype. We're capable of doing that with anything. The question is, is there a run rate business associated with it or is it a custom assay? 
And you know, those kind of conversations we have with people all the time. But the end game is we want to make a disease in a dish possible for all of you. So today, what Amber's going to be focused on is not the cardiomyocytes or any of the other assays. She's going to focus on our neural portfolio. And this is an area that has been growing explosively for us. Um, with the cell types that we've launched and the breadth of line that we have, I think I can very safely say we're the market leader in this area. And we just have a very wide range of capabilities here. Amber's going to go into uh, a lot of the technical detail when she speaks. Um, I have a duplicate slide there. And you're going to hear a little bit about our, our microglia cells throughout the day. This was our last uh, big product launch. We've done a couple of product line extensions since then. But this was a big new product. As I mentioned, we launched a panel. It came with a lot of functional assays. And I think you're going to hear a lot more about this. I don't want to belabor it because uh, Amber is going to go into the technical. And before I close and hang over, hand over to uh, Amber, I, I will highlight also what our colleagues at uh, Irvine Scientific can help you with as well. Uh, their expertise is, is obviously in, in media, uh, buffers, and, and for helping customers formulate uh, media. Uh, they offer not only a wide range of off-the-shelf products that you can also learn more about on their website, but I think one of their real core capabilities is working with people on custom, uh, taking their formulations and getting them to a manufacturing scale with the capabilities that they have. Um, and uh, uh, one set of products that I'll point out, which I think is a good paradigm for their whole business, is the Balance CD uh, portfolio, where they have the capabilities to help you as a researcher get from that initial research stage of your portfolio all the way up to production, powder capability, scaling up to bioreactor scale. Um, so they're, they're a very powerful partner in that area as well. And if you have those kind of needs, they're here to talk to you today as well. So to summarize before handing over to Amber, I think our, our real value to customers today is, is delivering the cells that we have as products. But behind the scene, is decades of, of company experience in reprogramming cells, manufacturing those cells, and testing them for accurate phenotype and genotype. That's really our value to all of you. We can help take some of that core expertise and, and help you ex accelerate your research. That's our goal, is to use this technology to help you. So I'll ask if there's any questions for me. I'm, I'm just a the overview guy, so uh, you probably will save your questions for Amber, but if there's no further questions, I'll, I'll pause and we'll just do a quick transfer over to Amber. Is that? There's that. Thank you. And I left that on. All right. Thank you very much, Keith. So how's the sound? Is it still okay? Awesome. Great. Well, first of all, I just wanted to say how much of a pleasure it has been uh, in my experience working with Fujifilm so far, working with Keith and the rest of the team. I come from a background that's a very academic background. I actually transitioned from uh, eight years of postdoc in the Bay Area at UC Berkeley and UCSF, and I transitioned into industry just in 2019. So for me, I haven't been in industry for very long, but I have to say the emphasis and the uh, meticulous nature of all the scientists behind the scenes at FCDI is just fantastic. So it's a, it's a really world-class group of scientists at FCDI. And I wanna say that even though Sean and I are kind of the face of the company in the Bay Area and in California, we have a fantastic tech support group with a wide variety of expertise Every, everything from you know, a very traditional patch clamp to cutting edge assays, we are working with our internal team and as well as collaborators to develop state of the art assays. So it's been just a wonderful experience for me personally, and I'm just happy to be a part of the team and help you access cells. So a little bit, um, a, a little bit of my motivation, again, for being part of this company is to help facilitate people to do better cell biology in a dish. And as a company and as a um, society and as those who have supported the uh, embryonic stem cell and IPS stem cell derived cells as a movement, we all have the same motivation that we want to move away from animal models and we also want to get more closely 
uh, to most more close to the clinic. So we want to be more clinically translatable. That is the whole point and the whole emphasis of this uh, talk and, and of the science that we would like to help you perform um, and enable you to do as well. So we're here to help you to do that. Today, I'm going to focus on diseases of aging and how to model diseases of aging in a dish. These are tricky things to do. We're talking about complicated diseases that are associated with phenotypes that develop slowly over time in a human as they age, as we are insulted with onslaught of things uh, in the environment from infections to just life and growing old. So this is not an easy thing to tackle and I'll go into a little bit more detail there. But we're gonna focus on Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and age-related macular degeneration today. If you, you already probably know the first two are associated with dementia. The last one is a very uh, common form of, it's an ocular disease and it's a leading form of uh, blindness. So these are all associated with aging. So today I'll go over our neural portfolio in a little bit more detail. I'll talk about how to actually um, model neuroinflammation in a dish. This is a, a thing that we get a lot of questions about from our current clients. Um, and we do have clients from all the top biotech and pharma industries represented uh, already either per currently purchasing or have recently purchased our cells. So neuroinflammation is a hot topic. And I'd like to go into just some preliminary data that we have on that with the um, acknowledgement that we would like you to take this data and then take it to the next step. I'm gonna then talk about the Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and AMD disease models, and then I'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. And if we can't get to everything today, we will definitely get back to you um, by email afterwards. And I wanted to also say that um, we're gonna have some sign up, a sign up sheet for individual meetings at, immediately after the seminar. So we should end around two o'clock. I think Sean's gonna go ahead and pass that around. Awesome. And I'll pass it around. We're going to have a short break at one o'clock. So I'll allow people to go into the lab. And I'll pass it around at that time as well, in case anybody wants to it. Right. So we'll, we'll take a little break around one o'clock, and then um, we can reconvene after that. All right. So to get into the neural portfolio, uh, the first uh, neuronal product that we launched is the iCell GABA neuron product. It has the most publications of all of our neural products simply because it was the first. You might see in the literature it being referred to as iCell neurons. We now know that they're predominantly a GABAergic population, so predominantly an inhibitory type of a neuron. Our iCell GABA neurons and our iCell gluten neurons are both kind of similar in that they're both uh, mimicking the cortical forebrain region of the brain. Uh, the GABA neurons are, again, predominantly inhibitory. They're about uh, 85, 90% GABAergic, with the rest being glutamatergic neurons. And the isoglutin neurons are the excitatory type of neuron, where we have uh, about 80% glutamatergic and the rest GABAergic. And this is actually an advantage because you get really good data on a multi electrode array type of an assay when you have a mixture of this sort. Uh, and the reason for that is if you had pure excitatory neurons, just a pure population of glutamatergic neurons, it would be a seizure in a dish. And likewise, if you had 100% pure GABA neurons, it would be very inhibitory not much going on there. And I hope that you can see this movie playing here because this shows that um, all of these uh, neurons are actually able to fire action potentials. So they spontaneously fire action potentials. You don't have to do anything to them. They're going to form this neural network. It's a nice purified monolayer of neurons and they're going to start firing together. So here you can see individual action potentials. The nice thing that you can see, and I'll show you some data in a bit, is that you can actually modulate the neural network uh, bursting in synchrony. And you can do that by co-culturing with glial cells, but they'll do it by themselves anyway. So just a pure monoculture, they'll start beating together and talk to each other. And that's a nice thing to be able to model in a dish. It's a, able, a very enabling technology. So we also offer glial cells. So here we have our isoastrocytes. astrocytes. The isoastrocytes astrocytes express, of course, the characteristic astrocyte markers, including S100 beta and intermediate filament, GFAP, and they secrete trophic factors. We have our I-cell dopa neurons, which are a uh, very pure population of human floor plate derived midbrain dopaminergic neurons. These are used uh, widely for studying Parkinson's disease. And I'll go into the more details on that in just a minute. Um, but these are mimicking more the substantia nigra region of the brain. So again, very relevant to studying Parkinson's disease. We have our I-cell motor neurons, which also fire spontaneous action potentials. And you can see that in this image here. 
Um, the isomotor neurons can be cultured like the other neurons in monoculture, or they can be mixed in a co-culture situation. And then the last product that we have more recently launched, launched are the iCell microglia. The iCell microglia are critical for studying diseases of aging and neuroinflammation, which is an integral part of studying diseases of aging. So these microglia are a wonderful product, widely used, very much in demand. Um, they, we have a lot of disease models in these microglia as well, and I'll show you a little bit of that information in just a minute here. So this is a summary table of our neural disease models. We've had these models around for quite a while, and they've um, proven to be very useful, and many of them have been uh, published on, um, including the APP or amyloid precursor protein models just listed at the top in our GABA neuron background. There's essentially a couple of different ways one might be able to create a model using an iPSC technology like ours. One way would be to take the healthy cells, and then when they're in the iPSC stage, genetically engineer them and create a mutation that you know is going to mimic a disease of interest. And that's the type of model that we call, or the, the type of uh, approach that we call a model. So under the second column there, it says source. If it's a model, that means that we genetically engineered them at the iPSC stage, but the background iPSCs are from an apparently healthy normal donor. Um, and as you can see in the last column there, there's the donor ID. So if it says 1279 or 1434, those are our healthy donor backgrounds. And so you can tell also by um, the, gene, the genotype listed there what was modified in that particular line. We also have another approach that a lot of people will take, which is to take cells from a patient presenting with a disease. And that's uh, what we call a donor. So for example, on this list, you can see that there's an autism spectrum disorder donor line. We do not know the contributing genotype that causes the disease phenotype, um, so that's why it says unknown, but you can also tell that this is a disease donor by the donor ID in the last column. Um, and then I wanna point out that TREM2 is um, a very popular product of ours, and we have the TREM2 knockouts, both a homozygote and a heterozygote available in our ISO microglia background. Um, this is readily um, available and again, sold quite frequently, so a lot of people like to take advantage of this uh, model because you also have the isogenic healthy control. And then we also have our recent launch of a panel of microglia that were all of these on this table were derived from um, a new cohort of um, cells. So we have a variety of clinical presentations, well, two different types of clinical presentations. We have apparently healthy normal background and then we also have an ad which is presenting with alzheimer's so these are known uh, patients that are known to be presenting with dementia by standard um, cognition tests in the clinic so the nice thing about these apparently healthy normal donors are is, is that the uh, age at donation is much older than uh, the rest of our donors um, so you do have that kind of epidemiology in a dish type of opportunity where you can design your assay where you can do your age and gender matched uh, healthy control to your disease um, cells. So this, all, this list also includes a TREM2 R47H uh, donor. Uh, so this is also used often in, in um, conjunction with the healthy isomicroglia and the knockout, engineered knockout microglia. We are also offering a, um, APOE, uh, different APOE genotypes. We have quite a few here with the APOE44 genotype, which again is a very popular mutation. And I'll go into that in a bit as well, in more detail. The um, one thing to point out too, is that our CD33 donor here is a protective allele. So this particular allele is a protective um, SNP. Okay, so now I'd like to go into just some preliminary type of a data, but it's, I think it's very informative and it's a good jumping off point when we're talking about modeling neuroinflammation. So, the microglia are an amazing innate immune cell in the brain. So when you think about how would you model the pro-inflammatory response of an innate immune cell like the microglia, you might think of designing an assay in a way like this, where you would stimulate the microglia with a bacterial antigen like LPS, or with something that goes systemic, a cytokine like interferon gamma or GMCSF that would be triggered by an infection and then would stimulate the microglia. And then your readout might be something like uh, TNF-alpha, I1-beta, IL-6, or IL-8, you know, there's really big pro-inflammatory molecules. 
And in fact, um, what we see is that we actually get a really nice response. Um, so this assay is a Luminex assay. This is an ELISA type of an assay where we're collecting the supernatant before and after stimulating the isomicroglia, microglia, which is cultured in pure culture. Uh, so when you can see in the first bar uh, that this is the unstimulated set, and maybe I can sh hopefully show you uh, with my laser pointer here, but if you look at the IL-6 secretion levels, um, here's the basal level and picograms per mil, and it's a log scale, so these are really big increases. So this is unstimulated, and here is stimulated with LPS. Um, and then the biggest bar here is stimulated with a combination of LPS and interferon gamma. So, and likewise, TNF-alpha stimulation is all, uh, uh, secretion is also stimulated um, by treatment with LPS or interferon gamma or a combination of both. Now, an ideal anti-inflammatory response measurement might involve the uh, stimulation of isomicroglia with one of these types of molecules, like IL-4, IL-13, for example, and then looking at uh, a set of kinds that are associated with the anti-inflammatory response, such as IL-10, uh, for example. Um, so we are still collecting um, data on that, but what we do have is a very nice information from this initial screen where we stimulated with LPS um, that is exactly as expected. So what happens when you stimulate innate immune cells with something like a bacterial antigen is that you stimulate both a pro-inflammatory and an anti-inflammatory response. And I know from my academic background that this is to be expected because part of the inflammatory response that needs to be controlled in an infection is, involves the anti-inflammatory response. So first you trigger the pro-inflammatory response and that has to be resolved. So there's these resolution pathways that also are triggered simultaneously. And that's exactly what we see here. So we see IL-10, for example, is also stimulated with um, LPS treatment. You see a little bit of IL-13 as well. So this is great preliminary data that we'd love to see you take another step further. We see um, trophic factor secretion also by the I-cell astrocytes, so another very important glial cell that a lot of people want to use in co-culture situations with our neuronal cells. So here you can see stimulation of the I-cell astrocytes with increasing concentrations of IL-1 beta, a very pro-inflammatory molecule. And you can see increasing secretion of IL-6. Likewise, we show that our ICEL astrocytes secrete a basal level of APOE without any kind of drug treatment. So just to point that out on this graph, because we're adding the drug here, this first data point is the amount of basal APOE uh, being secreted by the I ICEL astrocytes. So that's a really important um, check mark that a lot of our clients will request to see that data. So we have that, and then we also see the increase in APOE secretion. So APOE, it's an important protein involved in uh, cholesterol transport. So APOE is produced by the astrocytes, transported, uh, uh, it, it transports cholesterol from the astrocytes to the neurons via APOE receptors. And this is also associated with Alzheimer's because Alzheimer's is uh, known to involve uh, APOE in particular, and it's a, a hot topic of study. So here we sh we're showing that this is a uh, basal activity of the isoastrocytes, that they are always going to be secreting APOE, and that you can stimulate uh, further secretion of APOE by treating with this particular drug, which activates the liver X receptors and the retinoid X receptors. Another aspect of studying neuroinflammation would be a co-culture system. So this is actually much older data that we've had around before the new interest in neuroinflammation um, really became a hot topic. And I'd like to point this out to you. So just to orient you in case you have never seen a raster plot or, or kind of analyzed um, a multi-electrode array or MEA type of an assay, uh, what this data shows is uh, if you look in the top left corner here, each one of these raster plots is a well in an MEA assay. Each little dash or dot on the raster plot is an individual action potential, and each vertical line is the entire network bursting in synchrony all together. So that's, again, a very nice thing to witness when you have the entire neural network bursting simultaneously, all the cells together at once. So again, that's indicated by these vertical lines, and then the x-axis is, uh, is time, right? So time on the x-axis, and then the um, electrode is on the y-axis. So what you can see is if you plate the same number of I-cell glutineurons in each of the wells, this is kind of the result uh, that you get. You get 
maybe two or three neural network bursts, and that happens in the same amount of time. And I, I can tell you exactly, you know, this is 120,000 gluten neurons in each well. Now, if we add a small amount of astrocytes to that culture, so 120,000 gluten neurons, 20,000 astrocytes, see what it does to the electrical activity of that neural network. So if just adding those astrocytes, you increase the number of neural network bursts. Now you see more like six in each well. And you also really clean up the individual action potentials being fired by lonely neurons. And so you see how cleaned up that is, how much white space there is between those synchronous neural network bursts. You can modulate um, your MEA data by changing the amount of glial cells. In this case, we're keeping the same number of gluten neurons and doubling the number of astrocytes. Or you can double both the number of gluten neurons and astrocytes and really pick up the speed uh, of that neural network burst um, rate. So this is also reflecting how these cells are supposed to perform natively in vivo. So this is to be, to be expected because we know that isol astrocytes promote an earlier formation of a more organized network activity uh, through synaptic signaling and clearance of glutamate from the synapse. And we all know that glutamate um, is, of course, the principal excitatory neurotransmitter in the CNS, and excessively high extracellular glutamate uh, can result in neurodegeneration uh, because of the excitotoxic action of the glutamate. So this is uh, another important slide showing how isol astrocytes uptake the extracellular glutamate in a dose-dependent manner. And then that can also be inhibited with this drug here. So this demonstrates their ability to clear the excitatory neurotransmitter from the synapse. In this uh, slide, what we're looking at is some data that was produced in a collaboration with Sartorius using their IncuSight instrument. And they just do long-term live cell imaging. It's very easy, uh, kind of an assay to perform. And we love this kind of a readout. A lot of people are looking at phagocytosis in general when they're studying neuroinflammation and then also when they're just looking at microglial activity. So here in this experiment, we have um, labeled a neuron cell line uh, with a Frodo dye. So this is a pH sensitive dye that turns fluorescent once it's inside the very acidic environment of the lysosome. So that's an indicator that the entire phagocytosis process has completed and it's at the end. So ephrocytosis is the term we give to phagocytosis of apoptotic bodies of dying neurons. And so this is a nice, um, in vitro recapitulation of the role of microglia in clearing apoptotic bodies of dying neurons as they would in a healthy uh, brain and also in a diseased brain to deal with those uh, dying neurons. So here, um, what you're looking at here in this graph is the amount of fluorescence over time. The fluorescence indicates active uptake or active phagocytosis by the microglia. And you can see over time in the blue line, this is microglia with the apoptotic uh, neuro 2A uh, neurons. And then this is the gray line is without the microglia, but with the Frodo labeled neurons. And lastly, without going into the details of this um, slide, I wanted to just tickle your brains and let you know that we are working on a multiplicity of approaches of modeling neuroinflammation by doing these really um, complex model systems and enabling you to work with other uh, groups to create these more complex systems in order to study uh, disease phenotypes in a, in a more um, in vivo like way. So this can be described as being uh, either like a 2.5D, like a hanging drop type of a spheroid of uh, more uh, yeah, a spheroid type of um, nature, or you can do something like a microfluidic de device. So there are some of these in the market as well where you can do microfluidics. And um, blood-brain barrier modeling would be one thing that you might want to do in a higher, more complex uh, system. And so we, what we want to do is to provide material that allows you to do these complex types of uh, cultures. All right. So that brings us to our first disease in a dish, and that's Alzheimer's disease. So as you know, Alzheimer's disease is um, something that affects a lot of people, unfortunately, and I know that a lot of families who have been affected by Alzheimer's disease. It affects women more than men, and it, of course, the odds of getting Alzheimer's increases as one ages. So the most likely group of people to develop Alzheimer's would be women uh, over the age of 85. 
Um, Alzheimer's, uh, an Alzheimer's brain is not something pretty to look at. You can see here a healthy brain as opposed to a brain from someone with advanced Alzheimer's. Usually people associate Alzheimer's with the development of either plaques or neurofibrillary tangles. So people are often thinking about amyloid beta and tau proteins when they want to study Alzheimer's. Um, there's a lot of wonderful work being done in the field to uh, make progress on the treatment of Alzheimer's, although unfortunately it is a very complex disease and there's not a lot um, for patients. So we, if you've seen the news lately, you know about this uh, relatively new Alzheimer's disease drug. Um, and that there was a big deal in the news about this. This is um, from Biogen. And this drug is called Algehelm. It's newly FDA approved. And uh, the way that Algehelm works is that the Algehelm antibodies will bind um, the amyloid plaques and may clear the amyloid from the brain via the bloodstream and also may recruit immune cells to ingest the amyloid deposits. So this is a great you know, um, potential progress in the field of therapeutics. But the jury is still out as to how well this is going to um, help patients. And there's some diversity in the Alzheimer's um, patient population as well. So the association of amyloid, or the present, um, when patients have amyloid beta plaques, that doesn't always correlate to all of the phenotypes associated with Alzheimer's. It's not a perfect correlation. So we'll wait to see um, how well this, what this does in the clinic. And actually, uh, to that point, we also have some limitations when we're trying to study Alzheimer's using animal models. Um, so if you look at how this actually um, separates out, there is less than 1% of Alzheimer's disease um, presentation is linked to a genetic mutation in the genes that we currently think about when we think about Alzheimer's. So that includes you know, APP alone or in combination with PSYN1. Um, or uh, PSEN2 mutations. About 95% of Alzheimer's disease is actually going to be um, part of this heterogeneous pathogenesis linked to more than 20 genes. Um, the greatest influence when we're talking about this type of Alzheimer's has to do with APOE and TREM2. Um, and that's also where a lot of the uh, demand has been in the market for us to provide APOE and, and TREM2 um, mutant models as well. So there are uh, you know, some animal models, um, but there are some uh, limitations to that as, as well. Um, so none of the Alzheimer's transgenic mouse models have successfully recapitulated clear amyloid beta-driven uh, NFT formation or neuronal death. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a, a limitation. Um, and, and we can get into the specifics of that as well in, in a more in-depth conversation. But suffice it to say that Alzheimer's is uh, quite complex. We also know that there is an involvement of uh, blood-brain barrier breakdown in, in the early stages of the development of Alzheimer's. So it would be nice to be able to target Alzheimer's early on uh, before it actually develops into the point where there are plaques and tangles. So if we look at Alzheimer's genetics in more detail here, you can see um, the risk of Alzheimer's in this genome-wide association study. The risk of Alzheimer's uh, on the y-axis and the frequency in the population on the x-axis. And again, um, so we know that these particular genes cause Alzheimer's, but in, a, in very few cases. We're talking about PSN1, PSN2, and APP. But really, a lot of, um, uh, of work needs to be done to understand what's the role of APOE and TREM2. Um, and there's a lot of research that's focusing on that as well. So in order to facilitate this type of research, Oh, this is a summary table. This is similar to what I just showed you before, but this is just calling out what are the FCDI uh, lines available for, for Alzheimer's disease research. And, and we kind of went through this a little bit before, but again, the focus uh, here also is, you know, APOE, as I can point out here. We have the APP mutants, but we also have all the different APOE genotypes. So APOE 22, 23, uh, 44, and then 33 is the healthy that we also have. Um, and uh, TREM2 mutants, which I called out earlier as well. All right, so that brings us to the question, how have people used iCell products historically to study Alzheimer's disease in a dish? So I'd like to explore that with you um, a in a little bit more detail. So this first uh, study, this was kind of a preliminary um, setting up the experiment. So here we have pure healthy iCell GABA neurons 
and we're measuring the amount of uh, secreted tau and amyloid beta. And we would expect both tau and amyloid beta to be secreted at some level uh, from the healthy cells. And then we want to see if we could then modulate that and see if we can cause disease. So here we're showing with these um, alpha Lysa kits that we do actually get uh, measurable levels of tau and amyloid beta proteins that are consistent with a healthy normal donor. Um, and you can see that the expression levels of tau and amyloid beta are stable and reproducible. So these graphs are really looking at uh, data over time and from lot to lot. And we see lot to lot consistency and we see uh, the data over time is also very consistent. Now, importantly, uh, we can modulate the amount of secreted um, amyloid beta as is uh, shown here on the top graph here um, by using a gamma secretase inhibitor um, to, mod to modulate the amyloid beta levels. But then importantly, you can also um, modulate the ratio of amyloid beta 40 to 42. Um, and I think this is quite important because amyloid beta 40 is, is the major species of amyloid beta, which is um, produced, produced a, uh, <laughs> that is accounting for um, over 70% of the total amyloid beta produced. And the remaining amount is the amyloid beta 42. So the, it's the amyloid beta 42 that's associated with forming aggregates and with the disease. Um, so this is something that can be modulated again in that healthy uh, cell background. And this is generally the approach that was already taken in order to do an Alzheimer's uh, disease screen. So I wanted to point this collaboration out with GlaxoSmithKline. This was published um, in um, 2013 in, in stem cell research. This is a nice screen. So in this uh, screen, what they did is they, uh, they exogenously added the amyloid beta 42 um, peptide and that, again, is sufficient to induce a model of Alzheimer's disease. And that allowed them to then screen a large number of compounds, over 300 compounds, for neural protection in this high throughput format. And they identified 19 hits, which confirmed the reliability and sensitivity of uh, the platform. And this is something that was a really uh, well described in the paper. And it also allowed them to distinguish between the CDK2 and CDK4 pathway involvement. And another study here, uh, we're uh, in a collaboration with Merck, and this, this uh, study was published in 2015. Uh, here, the healthy isogaba neurons were cultured, and then either tau oligomer or tau monomer uh, seeds were added to the neurons. And it was only the oligomers that induced the internal accumulation and aggregation of the uh, hyperphosphorylated tau, which is associated with disease. And they also show nicely some um, clear phenotypes, so they include neurite degeneration, the loss of the synapses, uh, aberrant calcium homeostasis, and an imbalance in the neurotransmitter release. So not only is it just looking at neuronal death, but you can look at all the um, early signs of neuronal death as well, again, as a result of the tau um, oligomer being incubated with the healthy cells. Um, and then lastly, I like to um, highlight this particular paper from 2014, because this is a paper in which our disease models um, were used. So this is a paper that looked at our engineered um, amyloid precursor protein or APP mutations. And they uh, did that side by side, nice cell biology control where they have that engineered mutant and then they have the um, healthy control. So you have the isogenic control. And in addition to the mutant, they had the protective variant. So it's actually three different uh, cell types and controls included in that paper. Um, and that, that's a nice way to look at it. So you have the APP mutant associated with developing assay, uh, Alzheimer's disease, the APP mutant associated with protecting someone from Alzheimer's disease, and then you have the isogenic healthy control. So this is a nice way to set up an assay, and it's the type of an, uh, setup that we would promote you to use um, by taking advantage of our, our portfolio of ISIL products. Um, so in this paper, um, using these mutants, what they saw was that the protective variant resulted in lower levels of, of amyloid beta production and improve the uh, neuronal activity. Yeah, and you can see the details um, by reading the paper as well. We'll give all the references afterwards. So that brings me to microglia and the, the role of microglia in Alzheimer's disease. So this is one of the reasons why a lot of people will ask us about phagocytosis and how to perform a phagocytosis assay. So um, microglia are gonna phagocytose those amyloid beta plaques 
And that's a common readout uh, that people want to see is how well are our microglia phagocytosing amyloid beta. And as you can see in this little diagram here, you can see the tau tangle inside the neuron, the amyloid beta plaque, and then you can see the microglia trying to attack that large um, amyloid beta plaque. So um, in the Abood paper from 2017, there's a really nice figure here that I thought I would share with you as well. Um, so in this paper, it was kind of similar to the approach of treating the GABA neurons with an exogenous inducer of Alzheimer's disease. In this case, we have healthy isomicroglia, microglia, and they're treated with fibrillar amyloid beta. And when you treat the healthy microglia with fibrillar amyloid beta, what you see is an alternate, uh, uh, alteration of the gene expression profile that matches what you would expect from the genome-wide association studies to be altered genetics. So in other words, what, I, what you see here in gray are the fibular amyloid beta responses. And if you look at what genes are being upregulated, it's CD33 is on there, ABCA7 is on there, TREM2 is on there, APOE is on there. Those are some of the major top hits. So this is um, a really nice proof of concept and proof of principle that you can recapitulate disease type phenotypes in a dish. All right. Well, if my computer is freezing, then it may be time for a, a break here. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, all right, well, um, so wanted to go into a little bit more detail real quick here of the Alzheimer's engineered disease models that we offer. So I just wanted to point out the, um, uh, so we have the apparently healthy normal isomicroglia, then we have the TREM2 homozygote, the TREM2 heterozygote, and we also have MECP2 a knockout as well. Um, so MECP2 traditionally is associated with Rett syndrome, but a lot of people are also studying it with regards to its role in Alzheimer's. So I just wanted to let you know that all of these uh, mutants are from the same donor, the same 1279, um, donor. So that's the nice thing about these products is that you have those controls. So TREM2, let's talk about just very briefly about what TREM2 is and why everybody's talking about it with regards to studying Alzheimer's. So here's um, a diagram of TREM2. It's this transmembrane protein. It's got an intracellular signaling side to it, and it's got this extracellular soluble form. We call that little s TREM2. Um, this is a has been of interest to the Alzheimer's community um, for a couple of reasons. You know, one is that there's a histidine to tyrosine mutation that boosts Alzheimer's risk by as much as 11 fold. And interestingly, that mutation actually enhances the rate of TREM2 cleavage and increases the amount of soluble TREM2, which was a little bit counterintuitive um, initially. Uh, TREM2 cleavage occurs naturally by proteases. So, uh, ADAM10 is one of those natural proteases that cleaves TREM2, um, and that happens at amino acid uh, 157. And so the soluble TREM2 is then released into the media. So again, there's an intracellular signaling side, which might have to do more with phagocytosis, regulating the signaling uh, cascade that leads to the phagocytosis of amyloid beta, and also of the apoptotic neurons um, through the process of efferocytosis. So we decided that we would provide uh, you with some models of TREM2 that would be uh, more relevant to studying the disease. And so that's why this was designed in this way, where what we are offering is um, engineering uh, the TREM2 protein at the site that is indicated by that blue star here. So if you see the blue star, this is on the extracellular side. So what we're doing is we're blocking that soluble form of TREM2, but we're leaving the rest of it intact. So the intracellular side is intact. And that's very important um, and, and interesting in terms of the data that we show and putting it in context. So we have, again, these three um, allele sequences here. So this is apparently healthy normal is listed on top. The heterozygote is the next one, which has a scrambled amino acid sequence and highlighted in yellow. Um, and then the homozygote is really more of a compound heterozygote, but you can see um, it's, uh, it's uh, a heterozygote. So the data here to show that we have created these mutants correctly, we are doing a, both a, an ELISA to look at soluble TREM2 and a Western blot using an antibody that just recognizes the soluble portion of TREM2. And you can see, um, as expected, the homozygote knockout, you can't see any soluble TREM2 here. 
or in the Western blot. Um, the heterozygote has this intermediate kind of a phenotype, both here and in the Western blot, and then the healthy has the highest levels. So this shows that we did a nice job with our genetic engineering. And likewise with the MACP2 uh, mutant, we always have these types of controls when we create our mutants and just want to let you know that, so MACP2 is an excellent gene, so um, our donor is male, it only has one copy, and we're showing here that we have created a functional knockout where you can't see any MACP2 on this Western blot. So this is kind of uh, the money slide that I wanted to get to. So if we're talking about phagocytosis, whether that be uh, in this case of uh, bacterial particles, or if we're talking about phagocytosis of something like amyloid beta, we see a very interesting phenotype here, both with the TREM2 heterozygote, homozygote, and the MECP2 mutant. So here, the expected level of phagocytosis, which is calculated using that Frodo dye assay I mentioned earlier, is, is shown here in that top line. Um, so the top dark green line in all these cases. Then if you look at the mutant, it's this defective phagocytosis phenotype that we see. And that's actually um, very interesting. And we would love for um, more details to be elucidated on, on that data as well. But it's re reproducible across multiple disease lines. So, and everyone asks about phagocytosis of Frodo labeled amyloid beta. So this is the slide that we wanna show um, for that question in particular. So here you see, this is, uh, we actually have some protocols um, and I can help you with how to perform this assay as well. If you're interested in getting that protocol, um, but we can help you with uh, designing an assay where you can actually monitor the phagocytosis of Frodo-labeled amyloid beta. And that's again, that um, pathological fragment from one to 42. And here we show the same thing. So this is phagocytosis of that Frodo-labeled amyloid beta. But in this case, we're comparing the healthy to the uh, TREM2 homozygote mutant. And if I can hopefully point that out. So here is the healthy and here's that TREM2 mutant. So phagocytosis of amyloid beta is defective in that TREM2 mutant. And this is, um, this kind of a assay readout has been used in high throughput screens as well. So here we have a 384 well plate format where you can perform that high throughput screen. And in this case, uh, LPS was either added or not. And then the readout was phagocytosis of that Frodo labeled amyloid beta. And this, this is a nice uh, way to do compound testing in high throughput. So all these types of imaging based assays, they're really amenable to high throughput assay uh, screening, especially for lots of drugs. Um, likewise, we see a kind of a complementary phenotype when we're looking at cytokine secretion. So here's a um, cytokine secretion uh, before stimulation and then after stimulation with LPS. And you, as you can see here, in the top line, this is uh, unstimulated. You don't see much cytokine secretion across the board or chemokine secretion. After stimulation, you see very high levels of cytokines and chemokines. And then uh, in the mutants, we see some quite uh, different phenotypes, especially you can see there are certain cytokines, IL-8 being uh, one of them, and then MCP1 being another, that in all three of these mutants, you have high uh, basal levels of secretion of these cytokines without any kind of stimulation at all. And that also leads itself to um, some involvement in the disease pathology and pathogenesis. So if we then look at the Alzheimer's microglia panel, um, going back to that, we see very similar types of results with the cytokine secretion data. So just wanna point out here on this table, the top row is N of four means four different patients. Uh, so looking at four different patient data with the APOE E4, E4 Alzheimer's associated genotype, and then comparing that to the healthy APOE genotype in the second row here. And when you make that comparison, what you see is an amplified IL-6 and TNF-alpha response. So here again, it's either, either with the engineered um, mutants or with our APOE and our TREM2 uh, donor here with the R47H uh, genotype, you can see these very interesting uh, trends that seem to be informative of a disease uh, pathogenesis. So um, with that, I am going to allow you guys to take a break and we will come back with Parkinson's disease and AMD modeling. And I um, encourage you to sign up for individual meetings that we can have with you this afternoon. So I think Sean will pass that around.
So yeah, it'll just be a moment for a break, but I'm gonna pass this around if you got we got some stuff. Amber, that was superb. <laughs> Thank you. More to come. How, about how much longer would you say for the, for the rest of it? About a 45 more minutes worth of presentation? Um, sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Our, uh, we showed a, we the typical screens in the Alzheimer PSD cells would be for suppressors that we, people use them for enhancers to find new load sizes for a surgery. Sorry, I didn't hear the first part. So the PSK slide you showed, yeah. they were looking for suppressors. Yeah. And I wondered whether anyone's answer is like to find new load size. So no, words, I haven't heard of anyone doing that. Because uh, the genetic contribution is relatively small. So there's something else driving the disease. Why hasn't anyone done that? You're brilliant. Yes. No, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I have, I mean, maybe they have, and I haven't heard of it. Because you showed in their. They had some dots that were strongly enhancing. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's really interesting. Those are probably as interesting as stuff in the other direction. Yeah. I mean, we were. Um, I would actually talk to these guys about that type of an approach because so um, we're trying to offer new products that are more like, for example, enabling like a, a CRISPR screen at the IPS level. People are not doing as much of that. And I think it may require some kind of. Um, modification before differentiation to do that type of a an assay yeah. um, but i'm i'm not really sure but it, no it's a it's a really good idea and, yeah um, we're doing all these in a single cell type and people come to you and say oh i want this done in a different cell type so the easy way you can definitely mix and match right so you can just add um, astrocytes and glutamines and then add amyloid beta we're trying to add microglia to the mix, but the media that is optimal for neurons kills the microglia, unfortunately. Um, so we're kind of developing that still. Um, but we, we have some um, matching genotypes in the glial cells that match the, the neurons. Yeah. We're still kind of developing that. So, so, but it's definitely a priority for our product manager. Have you talked to uh, mitokinase? So there are Parkinson's companies here. Have you talked to them? I think they reached out to Sean. I have not spoken with anyone at Mitokinin yet. No. Okay. Do you think that they've they might been, be interested? They've been generating their, uh, well, they've been doing primary cell work and they've been doing some IPSC cell work, but um, I think they've been doing that in hours and it's small to be better or not to be better. Mm -hmm. we, um, we were early investors in Liberia. Oh, yeah. And we were investors in, uh, in Pioneer. And so we have a, a strong overlapping interest with yours. So. Oh, very cool. No, I, I would love to talk to Mitokinin. And, and I mean, you know, I'm, I just started talking to clients a year ago. So I feel like I'm still learning what people are trying to do and have a lot to learn there. So we'd love those kind of introductions and yeah, getting that background. That. Yeah, thank you. You should probably get started so we don't lose everyone. Yeah. Hey, yeah, really. All right, I think we're going to kind of come back and get started on the next half of the talk. I might have uh, ruined your it's all right. It'll be recorded. They can watch later.
All right, I think we're going to get started pretty soon here. You have my rapid attention. <laughs> that's all I need. I just need one person. That's one really. Person. Okay. <laughs> Especially you. <laughs> What you don't appreciate is that there are uh, there are uh, not ten people online, but it's uh, emailing is good, and uh, in you're your, in the public spaces. Awesome. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> okay. All right, so I think we'll just go ahead and get started. So for those who are left, now I know you're interested in studying Parkinson's disease, which is phenomenal. Everyone studies Alzheimer's, but the real hardcore crew is gonna study Parkinson's disease. So here we go. All right, so what do we know about Parkinson's disease? Well, besides the fact that nobody wants it, um, it involves the loss of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. So this is exactly why I called this out in the earlier slides. Um, as to why we would like to provide and why we do provide the iCell dopamine uh, product that again mimics the region of the substantia nigra. And that's because of the involvement of this particular population of cells in the development of Parkinson's disease. So currently there are no biomarkers or screening tests for Parkinson's disease. Only 10 to 20% of cases are linked to a genetic cause, making this a complicated disease to study. Uh, we do know, though, that there is some kind of genetic link because those who, with an affected uh, parent or sibling have approximately double the chance of developing PD, and men are more likely to develop Parkinson's than women. So while women take the cake with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease is for the men predominantly. So no one gets uh, away from one of these uh, diseases. Um, so environmental causes may trigger Parkinson's, and that is kind of the consensus. Uh, and again, there's, there's no cure, but symptoms can be controlled with current therapies. The list of current therapies is very long, and a lot of the drugs that are used in current therapies are there just to kind of modify or modulate the um, unfortunate negative consequences of using uh, levodopa, le excuse me, levodopa. So levodopa is uh, synthesized in the brain into dopamine. So really this, um, it, it is a, a wonderful drug, a revolutionary drug, but it's just trying to um, manage the symptoms again by providing more dopamine to a population that cannot produce its own dopamine from its own dopaminergic neurons. Um, so levodopa is the main treatment, and then there are drugs that modulate levodopa. There are also dopamine agonists um, and then MIOB uh, inhibitors as well, which is an enzyme that breaks down dopamine. And there are also tremor suppressors. So again, a different type of a phenotype that we want to treat and, and suppress uh, the, the manifestation of the disease, but without actually curing the cause of the disease. So there's a lot of room here also for research and for new therapies to make a huge difference in this population, same as with Alzheimer's disease. When we're looking at, al al uh, excuse me, <laughs> when we're looking at animal models for Parkinson's disease, um, 
what we want to look for, it uh, would include Lewy body formation. So Lewy bodies are uh, often seen in the substantia nigra region in patients with Parkinson's disease. They look kind of like this. We see these cytoplasmic um, kind of clumps. And these are protein aggregates composed mainly of alpha-synuclein. Uh, and thus alpha-synuclein is the major protein linked to sporadic Parkinson's disease. So unfortunately, um, not all animal models recapitulate Lewy body formation. Uh, here's uh, kind of a, a review paper talking about some pros and cons of different uh, animal models of Parkinson's disease, which basically we just treat uh, rodents or monkeys with different drugs. So 6-OHDA, MPTP are our main ones, or rotenone, paraquat, or meth, interesting choice. Um, and with these drugs, we induce neuronal damage. So each, each approach has its own advantages and disadvantages, um, but with some common ones, including the 6-OHDA, which is a, a modified form of dopamine, 6-OHDA uh, does not um, create Lewy bodies in the animal model, and neither does MPTP, even though these are widely used uh, models. So we cannot completely recapitulate all the phenotypes of disease uh, with animal models, although they do a pretty good job of it. Um, so again, two common uh, animal models for Parkinson's disease are really often either a 6-OHDA treatment of rodents or an MPTP treatment of non-human primates. And I just want to call that out um, from these two different papers showing how that might work. The 6-OHDA approach in rodents is uh, widely used to what they do is they lesion one half of the brain or one side of the brain. Um, and that's shown here, uh, is, as you can see, tyrosine hydroxylase uh, is uh, here, if I can show here. Um, tyrosine hydroxylase is the marker of dopaminergic neurons. So that's shown in red in these pictures. And you can see that after injection of OH, this is injection of saline. And after injection of OHDA in this side here, you can see loss of those TH positive dopaminergic neurons in this rodent brain. And that's lost um, in the caudate uh, putamen and also in the substantia nigra here uh, as well. And the reason why this is done in one half of the brain and not the other is because with this rodent model, uh, what's usually performed is you have uh, just one, one hemisphere is an internal control, but also you can then subsequently um, inject either like a, a dopamine receptor agonist or a dopamine uh, releasing compound. And then that uh, will en enable the rodent to walk in circles. And then you measure the degree to which the rodent spins or turns or walks in circles after that um, treatment. So this is, and then this is compared to the wild type animal. So that's, that's a rodent model of Parkinson's disease. Um, for the non-human primate, you know, the, a nice more recent study in 2019, I thought was a nice animal model. There are different ways to do the readouts in monkeys, um, but MPTP is often uh, the drug of choice uh, for, the, for the monkey model. In this case, a video is recorded of the monkey treated with MPTP, and then that video is scaled by pathologists and experts in a Parkinsonian behavior, and they rank the behavior of the animal. In this case, they're looking at facial expression, resting tremor, um, balance coordination and gross motor skills, et cetera. So these are really a behavioral readouts that they're looking for. Now, interestingly enough, um, with our I-cell dopa neurons, one of the key uh, functional assays that we perform in order to validate that they are in fact dopaminergic neurons is also uh, something very similar to the MPTP treatment. So MPTP um, as a drug is, it is a neurotoxin, but it has to be first oxidized in the glial cells. Um, and then after it's oxidized, it becomes the MPP plus. And it's the MPP plus form that's the actual neurotoxin, which is taken up through the dopamine receptors and specifically kills dopaminergic neurons and not other types of neurons. And so this is um, a dose curve, dose response curve, showing the electrophysiological activity, the channel bursts or action potentials fired by the dopa neurons um, after increasing concentrations of MPP plus are added. Um, and you see the, the bursting goes up with the intact MPTP because it hasn't been oxidized yet into that toxic MPP plus form. Um, so this not only validates um, the fact that these are pure dopaminergic neurons in our culture, but also that um, you can use MPP plus as a way to model 
of Parkinson's disease uh, on our healthy dop uh, dopaminergic neurons. And another piece of functional data to validate the fact that our cell dopaminergons are in fact dopaminergons is uh, shown in this slide here, where we're looking at iPSC derived I cell dopaminergons side by side with um, our I cell neurons, which are now known as the I cell GABA neurons. And as you can see, there's basal secretion of dopamine only in the dopaminergons coming from the same IPS background, um, and not, which is not seen in, in the um, GABA neurons after that differentiation. So we did a really good job in our differentiation here. Our dopaminergons are dopaminergons, our GABA neurons don't secrete dopamine. So another quality control check. And the reason I wanted to show you that data was because I want to highlight this study um, from Wakeman and, and that group uh, published in 2017. Um, this actually takes advantage of the same kinds of animal model assays where they either induced that uh, Parkinson's phenotype and disease model by using 6-OHDA treatment in their rodents or by um, working with the monkeys. So, so this first piece of data here is showing grafting of our, again, human I-cell dopaminergons, which rescue the Parkinson's disease phenotype in their rodent model. So what they did here was the same thing I just showed you. So they just lesioned with the 6-OHDA, only half of the brain, and then they're inducing, uh, they're kind of stimulating the rodent to rotate and, and, and walk around in this uh, kind of circular carton I um, mean, they're doing that either uh, by injecting these unilaterally lesioned rats uh, with either uh, apomorphine, which is a dopamine receptor agonist, or with um, amphetamine, which uh, it allows dopamine to be released. So in both of these cases, if you can see um, here with the error bars here, um, in blue is what with, with the graft and the black is uh, the vehicle. So we see a really nice uh, rescue over many months after grafting our human eye cell dopamine neurons, you can rescue that phenotype in the rat model. And so that was um, especially seen after about four and a half months. So it does take some time for those neurons to graft in and become functional, but it's a really nice study uh, for us. Okay. Sorry about the computer being a little bit slow. Okay, so the next half of the same study was looking at the monkey model. So here they treated with M the MPTP, and they were looking um, at the ability for our I-cell dopaminergons to graft in and form that nice phenotype. So they're basically doing immunofluorescence assays to make sure that the neurons looked like neurons, that they actually and integrated into the brain and have the correct receptors. They're also not carcinogenic or uh, proliferating or reverting to a different cell type. And so none of that was observed. And this is a really nice study demonstrating um, that you can graft our healthy neurons into an animal model. So that brings me to our engineered cell model. So moving away from animals and into doing in vitro cell culture, we have a really hot seller, which is our alpha-synuclein mutant. It's the alpha-synuclein A53T mutant. It's a very common um, mutation seen in Parkinson's disease and we offer the isogenic control. So this is just another example of how we went in and engineered at the IPSC stage to create that isogenic um, control. So here's some phenotypes that would be as expected. So one, um, one way in which alpha-synuclein contributes to Parkinson's disease is by creating aggregates. So this is um, immunofluorescence showing alpha-synuclein aggregation um, using immunofluorescence data. I, you know, I, the somas, the cell bodies are overexposed and very bright here, but what I think that you can appreciate are using two different antibodies here on the bottom and with the alpha-synuclein mutant. There are a lot of aggregates, alpha-synuclein aggregates in the neurites um, that you can't see in the control cells. And when we uh, look at the data that was produced by us, as well as several different collaborators, we see that this data is uh, not only quantifiable, but also it's reproducible. And it, uh, what we see are increased agrosomes and also decreased neurite outgrowth in this mutant and the cell mutant. Um, we, all see, we also um, see that both SYN1 and PSD95 punctus staining is decreased. These are markers of excitatory synapse formation. And that, um, so that alone is interesting, but we also have uh, the electrophysiological data to kind of um, back that up. 
So we have differences in gene expression as expected by RNA-seq data, showing 132 genes upregulated and 25 downregulated. And again, these are, other than the alpha synuclein mutation, the isogenic uh, control, compared to the isogenic control cells. So this is a big change in the transcriptome just because of one uh, genetic modification. Um, so, but that brings me to the electrophysiology data. So by patch clamp, by MEA assay, and by calcium oscillations, you can see um, these clear phenotypes where you see decreased bursting frequency, but an increase in bursting intensity. And so that's a very telling um, phenotype. Um, one thing I wanna point out on this graph too is we often recommend people will, uh, to culture for 14 days uh, if you're looking at the wild type or the healthy isodopa neurons, because you really get that nice synchronous bursting, that mature neural network formation at day 14 as shown here. At day seven, it's just a little bit early as shown here. But the interesting thing is we already see a uh, difference in the mutant. You can see the calcium uh, bursts are stronger and more frequent even at the early days. So that suggests some strange and difference in modification of the neural network formation and synapse formation in those mutant cells. So um, this is a paper, or not really a paper, but a whole study uh, that was performed by Emulate. And this is, this is interesting because, um, so alpha-synuclein is also associated uh, not only with the aggregates, but it's been identified in body fluids, so such as blood and, and cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and, it, and it does seem to be a marker of Parkinson's, but we're un, it's unclear still if it actually crosses the blood-brain barrier. Um, and so this is, uh, this is a nice study that shows what you can do is use the emulate system, which is more of a microfluidics type of a system, to do a co-culture where you get a situation where you have basically a substantia nigra brain chip. And the idea here is that you can create a, like a blood-brain barrier model and see if uh, you can then study the contribution of alpha-synuclein by using the I-cell dopinerons, both the healthy and the, and the disease um, uh, model as well. Um, so in, to summarize their work, you know, their alpha-synuclein fibril-induced model was capable of reproducing key aspects of Parkinson's disease, which included accumulation of phosphorylated alpha-synuclein, as well as mitochondrial impairment, a neuroinflammation, and, and the compromised barrier function. Um, so I think you know, the nice way to view this is that you, you can create the blood-brain barrier with those endothelial cells here, and then you have the neurons on the top, um, as well as the um, pericytes to really create that tight endothelial barrier and then you have the glial cells in co-culture with the neurons. So it's a nice example of how one might go to the next step or the next level using our cells in order to model a disease, not just in a dish, but in a microfluidic device. So I wanted to also bring your attention to a high throughput screen that was published uh, rather recently using our cells. It's in, uh, in 2021, so very recent, and it's actually um, preprint. But this is, this is a nice example of how one might use our cells to do a high throughput screen in order to identify some kind of therapy for Parkinson's disease. Um, so in this, in this um, assay, the primary drug screen was performed against a library of small kinase inhibitors. And they were looking for a molecule that would reverse the disease phenotype in the alpha-synuclein A53T uh, cells that we uh, provide. And as a readout for their compound screening, what they assessed was tyrosine hydroxylase immunofluorescence. And it may sound a little bit counterintuitive, but they did normalize for the number of cells. So they're not actually looking for um, more cells being TH positive. What they're looking for is the same cell expressing more tyrosine hydroxylase. So if you start out with a mutant, either from a disease donor or engineered, and then you look for enhancement of tyrosine hydro hydroxylase expression after um, exposure to a compound that would increase the TH immunofluorescence and that allowed them to do a high throughput type of a screen. And I encourage you to look into this in a, a little bit more detail in, in your free time, but they, it, they did a nice validation study on here. And then their acid readout, so the primary acid readout was the enhancement of TH expression in an individual cell. And then their other readouts, uh, just kind of to verify the phenotype, were neurite length, axon degeneration, um, and then a reduction of alpha synuclein aggregates. Um, in our A53T dopa neurons, as well as um, proteomic analysis. And then they looked into the mechan mechanism of action as well. All right. 
So that brings us to our last disease. And if anyone's here still studying the eye, I commend you. I actually spent time in the optometry school at UC Berkeley. So I like this last one the most, but <laughs> this, um, my personal bias. So now we move to the eye. How do we study age-related macular degeneration? So this is a complex disease in a complex organ, just like the brain is a complex organ, so is the eye. Um, if you look at the side view of the eye, what we're gonna talk about is the retina. So light goes through the pupil, goes through the lens capsule, passes through the vitreous, and then hits the fovea, which is where the light is gonna focus. And the macula is the reg region surrounding the fovea. It's where light focuses on the back of your eye in the retina. So when we're talking about age-related macular degeneration, we're talking about the generation of the cells in the retina where the light hits. Okay. So what we sell are eye cell retinal pigment epithelial cells. So our eye cell retinal pigment epithelial cells, or RPEs for short, perform uh, really well, actually extremely well, and they're a wonderful alternative to other cell sources. Definitely um, improvements over uh, immortalized cells, and you get the consistency that you can't get in a primary uh, cell line. So here we have in our transwell system, we've plated our RPE cells, and over time, what you can see is the barrier function is improving. So generally speaking, people will assay our RPE cells after about a month in culture. Uh, and what they see is really beautiful tight junctions as shown here in that red ZO1 stain in that immunofluorescence image there. Um, the traditional measurement of the tight, tightness of the tight junctions is taken with a tier measurement. So our tier values are always gonna be greater than 200 ohms um, per square centimeter. So it's validated to be um, very uh, good at forming those tight junctions. And every uh, certificate of analysis that we give for every lot of RPE cells includes that tier measurement. So you know that um, these cells are, are good epithelial barrier uh, type of a cell. The other aspect of RPE biology is the ability for RPEs to be, uh, they're an epithelial cell and they're very polarized. So we've shown that not only are they polarized by imaging, but they're polarized by secretion of growth factors. And this is really important. So their cytoskeleton is polarized, their secretion of growth factors is polarized. So as would be expected, if we plate these on a transwell system, we see PEDF secretion only on the apical side, and we see VEGF secretion only on the basal side, exactly like in vivo. And this is very reproducible from lot to lot and from week to week. So W1, W2 is week one, week two, and across three different lots. So the polarization not only is established, but then it, it's maintained. Um, and, and that's a really uh, a great functional check that we have made um, very good RPE cells. Additionally, another functional assay that um, validates our RPE cells is the phagocytosis assay. So a natural function of RPE cells is to phagocytose the used up um, rod outer segments from those photoreceptors, actually any photoreceptor outer segment those RPE cells are going to phagocytose the used up bits and just digest them. So the RPEs are really the supporting cell. So when light goes in and is processed by those photoreceptors, that used up um, segments have to be taken in by the RPEs. And so, um, so this, is, this is a phagocytosis assay that we performed using that same photo red dye, where you can see the RPEs are phagocytosing those, um, those uh, photo labeled rod outer segments. All right, so that brings us to AMD. So what is AMD? Well, there's two types of AMD. There's wet AMD and dry AMD. And I really like these pictures. These images are courtesy of Dr. Kapil Bardi at the NEI. He's used our cells and he's been a fantastic collaborator over the years. And I, I like how he shows um, these images in such nice detail. So really what happens here is um, dry AMD always precedes wet AMD. So while wet AMD accounts for about 10% of AMD cases, it accounts for 90% of the blindness. And most of the therapies are towards wet AMD. But the reason I'm saying that dry AMD always precedes wet AMD is because that's how the disease progresses. So initially you have uh, an image like this one in the dry AMD situation, where you, in a normal situation, here's the retina, here are the photoreceptor cells here, and then underneath the photoreceptors are those supporting cells, the RPEs. Underneath the supporting RPEs is Bruch's membrane and then a bunch of choroidal capillaries. And together this region is called the choroid. 
So this pr provides blood supply, it provides a metabolic support system to the photoreceptor cells. Now what happens in dry AMD is that you get buildup of something called drusen, and that's shown here. It's like this little plaque that you can see in the back of the eye. So you get build up these little uh, plaques, which first of all block the passage of light, um, but then they also lead to the death of the photoreceptor cells. So over time you see death of photoreceptors. And then um, that's the majority of cases. Now what happens when dry AMD progresses into wet AMD? What happens is you get secretion of VEGF and VEGF induces um, new neovascularization. So the growth of new ve uh, vessels, blood vessels. And these new blood vessels are very leaky and they're prone to breaking. So those new blood vessels are gonna burst and then cause blood clots and blood bursts in that uh, retina. And so this is the cause of AMD. Here's another um, kind of description of how that disease progresses. So here is the normal situation. But if you look at the back of the retina um, in this retinal image, uh, you, can, you can see that it looks healthy. Whereas if you were to have a situation with dry AMD here, where you're uh, potentially getting these yellow spots, um, that's a sign of dry AMD when you look directly at the retina, that's the drusen. And then you can al also diagnose wet AMD by looking at the retina and seeing these blood clots and blood um, spots. Now, what does that mean for the patient? It means that they have a, a spot where they can't see in their vision, in their line of vision. So every, the world looks like it always has a kind of a black spot in the middle. And so this is how you know you might have um, age-related macular degeneration is if you always have this black spot that you can't see in your line of vision. So current AMD therapeutic pipelines are all focused on wet AMD. So everything that's actually um, used to treat patients is either going to be an anti-VEGF antibody, which is delivered via intravitreal injections, and so some brands are listed here, or there are, there's also photodynamic therapy, which is an earlier type of a therapy. And then there are some new, um, new things that are coming out in the market as well, but they're all very similar principle where they're gonna target VEGF, uh, be something similar to an anti-VEGF antibody. So for dry AMD, there's nothing that's um, currently being prescribed now, although there are many things in the pipeline. So here's a, a, a paper from 2016 that's just describing some, at, at that point, some um, drugs in development. And what you can see is that they're targeting complement, complement proteins. So here's the uh, target of the therapy for all these drugs in development. They are meant to treat either wet or dry, um, but it the complement target would probably treat both a, a wet or a dry type of an AMD. Okay. So um, I wanted to show you this um, study because here in this study, um, we're kind of looking at the benefits of using IPSC derived terminally differentiated RPEs in order to recapitulate disease phenotypes. And I, I like that about um, this particular study. So just to point out a few limitations of animal models, one important thing is that while rodents are very useful in research, rodent eyes do not have a macula. So kind of hard to study age related macular degeneration without um, an actual macula. That's not to say that they haven't, uh, that the animal models haven't contributed to our understanding of disease pathology and pathogenesis. It's just to say that they're not the perfect model. Um, and then there's also the non-human primate models, which are slow to develop disease, and they're difficult to genetically manipulate, although again, have been a useful tool for researchers. So if we look at the ability of iPSC-derived RPEs um, to recapitulate AMD phenotypes, in this study, they actually compared um, AMD models to normal donors and they saw what was expected. So they saw increased susceptibility to oxidative stress, increased um, ROS production in response to oxidative stress, higher levels of glycogen, higher levels of glycolysis, lower mitochondrial respiration. All of these would be associated with a mitochondrial defect, which is common um, in the RPEs as a part of AMD pathogenesis. They also saw lower PGC1 alpha expression and they saw a phagocytosis defect and a, a POS standing for the photoreceptor outer segment. So they, they, they actually, actually, excuse me, the phagocytosis element was measured, but it was unaffected. So really what they're seeing here is more of a mitochondrial type of a phenotype, which would be associated with an earlier stage of the disease um, before it progresses into later stages. 
And it's possible that they might see a phagocytosis phenotype if they were to take it um, either out longer in culture or try to um, stress the cells in a, a more severe way.